Hey Toy Fans, D21 Beast Rob here, back with a vlog for you guys tonight. Uh, I decided to kind of get personal with you guys, I guess, and share a passion of mine or let you know more about my passion for the X-Men. Uh, the reason I felt the need to talk about this is that a uh, solicit came out online tonight that shows Marvel's plan for their comic book starting in October of this year. And if you look at the list, You've got a Deadpool book on there, and you've got Death of X number one, but you don't have any other X titles. I mean, no Uncanny X-Men, no All New X-Men, no Astonishing X-Men, no Extraordinary X-Men. Basically, for the last at least 20 years or more uh, in comics, there have been no fewer than two or three X titles on the stands at one time. And that's assuming we're not counting things like Cable and Wolverine having their own books. So um, the X-Men have been a very large present in print for Marvel for quite some time. And this solicit that we're looking at here just kind of goes to show what I've talked about on my old show, Project Geek Week, what a lot of pundits in the gaming or in the gaming and the comic industry have talked about for quite some time. And that's Disney's general lack of disrespect for, frankly, a brand that helped put Marvel on the map and their belittlement of the property that got so many people into uh, comic books and into the Marvel brand as a whole growing up in the 80s, the 90s, and even the early 2000s. And, you know, there's, there's some debate about whether or not um, Fox is handling the rights to the X-Men correctly or not, but the fact is they paid for those rights in the late 90s in a move that saved Marvel Comics at the time. So it really... It's just kind of not Fox's fault, and uh, frankly, it's not Disney's fault, but they're taking their frustration with the issue out on the wrong people. And here we have a solicit that's showing, once again, the X fans don't matter to Disney, they don't matter to Marvel, and we're just going to be punished because of what we love. And it really just kind of makes me sad. Now, this could be the start of a whole other sort of epic crossover events where they kill off all the X-Men just to bring back three titles uh, that they'll start sometime in 2017. Who knows? But the fact is, they're toying around with the property that I really love and the property that got me into comic book reading in general. And I just, I don't know. I guess I'm trying to just express my feelings about how sad I am about that. And I thought the best way to do that would be to share with you why the brand is important to me. And I thought I'd share a couple of firsts with you. So my first experience with the X-Men at all was through the 90s Fox animated series. As many people who grew up you know, through the 90s, I was born in the 80s, but as many people who grew up in the 90s know, uh, the X-Men is what got you into, or the X-Men cartoon rather, is what got you into X-Men. And I remember watching Night of the Sentinels part one as it premiered on television, seeing Morph die, seeing the Sentinels for the first time, getting to know all of these really great, colorful characters, and it really just you know, swept me off my feet, I guess. You know, as a as a young kid, not seeing superheroes in this manner before. I had seen Batman, I'd seen Superman, because those movies were really big in the 70s and the 80s, and by that point, they'd been playing on cable and whatnot, but the X-Men was really something different, something like I had never seen before. And it that's what hooked me in right from the beginning. And there's other things that, that show introduced to me. Besides the Sentinels, I saw Magneto for the first time. I saw uh, the Phalanx Covenant for the first time, the Dark Phoenix saw. Um, I got to see characters like Forge, characters like Cable, you know, these time traveling characters, the introduction to Apocalypse. I mean, there's so many amazing things about that show that were great for people just getting into the X-Men. And at the time, it was basically adapting stories that were concurrent with the comics. Uh, so it was a great way to get up to date on what was going on in 90s X-Men comic books. And it's a big deal for me as a cartoon series and as sort of a life changing, I don't want to call it a life changing event, but it has heavily influenced me as an individual. So that's my first exposure to the X-Men. But um, I was also my first X-Men comic. I can tell you, I remember going to a Walmart and I uh, didn't really buy a lot of comic books at the time. Uh, my grandmother um, had actually picked up some comic books uh, around that time for me that she had gotten at a swap meet or something or maybe even a grocery store and I had a couple of Punisher comic books and a few other things which was really strange to give you know a nine or ten year old um, or I may even be uh, younger when I got those uh, a Punisher comic book the old John Romita run from the early 90s but you know she didn't read them she just gave them to me but uh, when I had my chance to buy my own comic book for the first time um, I was at a Walmart and my dad basically 
basically said, pick whatever you want. And I know he was really hoping that I was going to pick the Batman and Robin uh, comic book based off the animated series that was on Fox at the time. But I ended up picking up uh, X-Men 337. It was an issue that took place post Onslaught. Joe Mad Art. I'd never seen artwork like that before. The comic book itself just really surprised me. I bought the X-Men comic book expecting to just get a, you know, fistful of action and a characters flying across the screen. And that comic book is actually a bit of a slowdown issue. It shows the X-Men getting together for breakfast and everybody really upset. And I didn't understand at the time that the whole Onslaught epic had just happened. Um, but, you know, it's Wolverine sh speaking to Professor X in the rain and then showing up and saying, uh, Chuck's not coming to breakfast. It's Beast showing up in the bathroom and slipping on uh, ice that Iceman had put on the floor and falling into the bathtub and then Iceman's laughing at him. Cyclops wakes up and blasts the alarm clock uh, to instead of you know turning the switch off, Jean's making breakfast. Quicksilver's down in in the uh, kitchen talking to her. Uh, there's even an image of uh, J. Jonah Jameson in the comic because there's a part that takes place at the Daily Bugle briefly. This is a comic book that I read over and over and over and over again, and the cover fell off. I mean, and pages started falling out. And then the backup in the book was actually a Heroes Reborn title, but it was the new uh, origin story for the Fantastic Four, which was another cartoon that was on the air at the time. So it was really just an amazing book for me to have as the first comic book for me to pick up. And again, heavily influential on future purchases that I made. Um, I can tell you the first X-Men action figure that I picked up. Um, before I had X-Men toys, my brother and I were big Trekkies and my parents were Trekkies as well. So those are the toys that we kind of started with at a younger age. And it's kind of funny when you th uh, we think about it, uh, before we had X-Men toys, my brother and I would use the cast of Star Trek The Next Generation. Geordi naturally was Cyclops. Uh, Worf we used as a beast, <laughs> humorously enough. And of course, in something of a prophetic move, we had a Captain Picard figure, and you'd guess that he would be our Xavier, right? And it's kind of funny how that ended up becoming true. So uh, that's how we played X-Men up until we got X-Men action figures. But the first X-Men action figure I ever got, I, I really remember, um, there was a uh, holiday gift exchange uh, in my fourth grade class. and. Um, I saw a Magneto action figure on the shelves at a Walmart. I really wanted to pick it up for myself. My dad was telling me pick one thing, $5 and under, and action figures were that cheap then. So I picked up this Magneto and stared at him through the box, and I really kind of felt bad about making that my gift exchange item. And um, it actually ended up working out for me. Uh, that year in the class, class gift exchange, after everybody opened what they got, uh, we were allowed to do exchanges, and somebody had given me Nickelodeon Flome, which was a GAC-like substance with styrofoam in it, but it was something I wasn't really interested in. And I actually was able to trade the Flome that I got from the gift exchange with the kid I gave the Magneto to and got the toy that I really wanted, and that was my first X-Men figure, so that was really cool. Uh, this Magneto figure had a spark uh, emitter in the chest. You'd flip a switch on his back, and he actually came with a gun, which was kind of weird, and he'd hold the gun and the sparks would fire, and that was the Magneto action figure. I had no removable helmet or anything. Uh, the cape was removable, uh, and that started uh, more figures that I would get. Eventually, um, I picked up the... Uh, well, I didn't get it. I got it for Christmas, I guess. Um, the Captive Sabertooth, which is the Sabertooth in the torn green tank top with khakis. It's actually pulled straight from an early 90s comic where he was kept in the danger room for a while, muzzled and in gauntlets. I didn't know that at the time, but after I went back and read all the X-Men comics I'd missed, suddenly there was that action figure I had as a kid, which I thought was really cool. And during that same sort of time, he would actually spar with Psylocke in the danger room. So, uh, great nod to the comics. And Toy Biz was doing that all the time. If the character showed up in the comics, it was safe to say that they would get an action figure at some point. So uh, I got that the same Christmas that my brother got the Age of Apocalypse Weapon X Wolverine figure. And we weren't quite reading comics at the time, but he had interchangeable hands. He had a scythe. We read on the back of the box that Cyclops was the one who blasted his hand off. I mean, it was really cool stuff for us as an exposure to more X-Men stories than we were aware of, uh, only watching the cartoon at the time. And then, of course, the Monster Armor X-Men figures were available not too long after that. And we our uh, collection just kind of exploded from there. Uh, the first time that I saw the X-Men movie in theaters was really important to me. My parents uh, never took me to the movies ever as a kid. It just wasn't something they did. I've said in previous videos, I'm pretty sure the first time I went to the movie theater, it was to see the Flintstones live action movie when my grandparents were in town, which was a very strange choice and not that great of a movie. But I always remember um, when X-Men came out in 2000 for my 15th birthday, a friend of mine that I had at the time, haven't spoken to this guy in probably 15 years,
years or more. But uh, Daniel, he actually walked with me probably two miles to the closest movie theater, and he paid for my ticket for X Men for my birthday, and that's how I saw the first X Men film. It was already like a month after it came out, almost two months after it came out, still playing. And it was an amazing experience to finally see all these characters in live action on the big screen. Again, I didn't do movies very often, so that was a big enough you know treat for me as it was. But uh, definitely a moment uh, in a something I cherish basically. So. Um, also, I could tell you the first X-Men video game I ever played. Uh, X-Men Mutant Academy, or not Mutant Academy, excuse me, X-Men Mutant Apocalypse on the Super Nintendo. It was a game that we constantly, constantly rent rented from the grocery store, which you used to be able to do. Uh, and it's kind of to our luck, I guess, uh, we had dogs uh, in, when I was younger, my brother and I and my family, and they actually chewed the cartridge. We rented it so much, it was at our house so frequently that our uh, dogs were able to chew the cartridge and made it impossible for us to return it to the grocery store, which I'm sure my parents had to pay for, but at the same time, I got to keep X-Men Mutant Apocalypse, the video game, which was awesome. So I played that a lot and it had characters from the TV series. I was a big fan of Beast as a kid, still am today, hence my YouTube uh, handle. And uh, he was playable in the game, which was just phenomenal. And as I transitioned to other X-Men games, X-Men Mutant Academy, when the first movie was in theaters, Beast was a fighter in that game. That was really enjoyable for me. Just another way to express my love and, and joy for the property that is X-Men. So um, it's just I guess something that's very, very important to me. And I hate seeing this brand or this this ba basically family of characters that I've been familiar with longer than some people I know, longer than I've known my wife, frankly. Like uh, These are characters that have been part of me as a person, part of my world, my environment, from a very young age. And it really upsets me to see Disney just casting aside the fans of the X-Men property uh, in favor of dollar signs, frankly. They want to launch more titles. They want to make the uncanny in humans the new X-Men. And it's just, it's really frustrating and it's really sad. And honestly, the saddest part about all of this, if um, Disney is forcing Marvel to launch books that um, don't have X-Men characters or have a couple of sprinkled into an Avengers team, but no real X-Men team, I mean, Cyclops is dead at this point. Wolverine's dead at this point. Xavier's dead at this point. There's a lot of our characters that X fans hold you know, near and dear are gone. Uh, it just, when they put out a solicit like we see for October, it really makes you want to say, I want to boycott you know, Marvel. I don't want to buy any more X books because I don't appreciate what they're doing to my characters. But when I want to show a, uh, an expression of solidarity or, or kind of get my point across or how much they're hurting me as an X-Men fan, and then they don't even have books available for me to buy to boycott and effectively make the decision for me to not be a fan of their material that they're putting out. It's just really sad. Uh, we're getting the X-Men Marvel Legends, uh, and most, some people have them already if you pre-order through Entertainment Earth, but other people will probably get them in uh, August, and we might have a second wave of X-Men Legends this year, so I'm glad that we're still getting these little nuggets of uh, fandom coming out, but... And it's really just sad for me. And I don't know if I've really been coherent or gotten my point across to you guys. I just wanted to talk about something that was really important to me. Um, and I'd like to know, guys, if you're fans of the X-Men, if you identify with that group of Marvel characters, uh, let me know in the comments below. Post your own video vlogs. Tweet them at me. Uh, let me know about them. I'd like to hear your guys' memories and thoughts of the X-Men. Um, I feel like now as we're losing this property, as it's going away more and more, uh, we should speak louder, shout louder, let our, our voices be heard that we're unhappy about what's going on with the, the property that for people like me even got us to pick up a comic book in the first place. You can hit me up on Twitter and Instagram at D21Beast and I'll see you guys next time.